Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. James Franklin is the head football coach at Penn State University. Since taking over the program in 2014, Franklin has led the Nittany Lions to a Big Ten championship and three top 10 finishes. And in his first eight years as a college head coach, Franklin has mentored 68 players who have gone on to the NFL, including New York Giants star Saquon Barkley. In today's conversation, we dig into his journey from D2 quarterback to college coach, how he built trust in a tough environment when he arrived at Penn State, and the ways in which his leadership approach has evolved over the years. This conversation is a great one for anyone leading a team or looking to change the culture where they are. And one quick note before we get started. I'd love your feedback on this podcast so we can continue to deliver the type of content that you want most. Please take five minutes and complete our listener survey. You can find it on mollyfletcher.com by clicking on the podcast header or in the show notes of this episode. As a thank you, a few lucky participants will be randomly selected for prizes like a copy of my book, The Energy Clock, a Game Changer t-shirt, they're so comfortable, and a $25 Amazon gift card. Thank you for listening and sharing your comments. Let's dig in. Here's my conversation with James Franklin. Well, James Franklin, thanks for joining. I tell you, it's a treat to have you on. Uh, I appreciate you taking a minute. I appreciate the opportunity to be on. Uh, Looking forward to visiting with you. Absolutely. So I want to start with your background, right? Like, Let's start with your, you know, childhood and, and family. How did it shape you and, and, and really influence the the person that you've become today? Well, I, you know, obviously I think it's, it's, you know, had a big impact, obviously, like, like most people. So, um, you know, I grew up just outside of, of Philadelphia, Northeast Philadelphia. My mom's house was literally probably about three miles from the Philadelphia border. Um, had an older sister who still lives in the area, actually lives in my mom's house. I had mom and dad, dad, dad kind of was in and out of the picture for a long time. And then, and then left for good. My dad was actually in the air force, met my mom. Um, who was stationed in Manchester, England. Uh, they eloped to Ireland and came back to the United States. Uh, my dad got a job working for GM in Trenton, New Jersey. So they moved, uh, like I said, just outside of Philadelphia. So was raised predominantly by my mom. Um, but all my family was my dad's family because my mom's family was all in, in England. So um, kind of an interesting background. Also come from a, a biracial background. So you know, I think all these different experiences and different perspectives uh, I think it's been very important in my evolution and very important in, in my growth. Um, I think I got pretty good perspective. I can see things from a lot of different angles, you know, and then obviously went to college, was a first generation college student in my family. I went to a small college here in Pennsylvania called East Stroudsburg. Um, But, you know, not a big family, not a big family. Um, both my parents are deceased. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really just me and my sister now. And then, and then obviously my wife and kids. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, coaches played a big part in, in, in my role and, uh, in my growing up, uh, played a big part in that. There's no doubt about it. And, uh, I think, you know, in some ways that's probably why, you know, I got into coaching, wanting to, wanting to be able to make an impact on kids and, and young men's lives, kind of like what happened with me. Sure. Well, and I know it wasn't your life plan to be a, a football coach. In fact, you studied psychology, which ironically probably works out great, doesn't it, as a coach, um, I can imagine. But what ultimately drew you to coaching? Like you're saying, I, I went I went to college, um, you know, like everybody, I thought I was going to play in the NFL, and that's why everybody goes to a Division II school called East Stroudsburg, right? That makes sense. <laughs> um, but, but thought I was going to play in the NFL, and 
Um, you know, started out as a, a bio major, actually was thinking about possibly going to medical school and until I got to organic chemistry and, uh, and, and then things got real, you know, so uh, <laughs> I ended up switching my major to psychology, uh, really enjoyed, you know, my courses in psychology, uh, got a really close relationship with one of the professors who I still speak with, uh, Dr. Drago. And then, you know, like a lot of people, I did a couple of internships. I did an internship in a, an adult psychiatric facility and an adolescent psychiatric facility. And although I loved what I was studying, um, that's not what I wanted to do uh, for the rest of my life. So I was still trying to kind of figure out a way I wanted to make an impact on people's lives. I wanted to help people. Uh, I started coaching as a graduate assistant back at East Stroudsburg to get my master's degree paid for. And hopefully to go on and get a doctorate. And as I was doing that, I, I started realizing, you know, that I love the game of football and um, I was probably going to be able to make an impact on people just as much or more so uh, through the game of football and using the game of football to get a great education. So I started looking at this and I said, you know what, I, you know, I want to help people. I love the psychology stuff. But I really want to you know, help, and I, I didn't really see that opportunity the way I wanted to do it in in, in psychology or psychiatry, or whatever it may be. Uh, so started coaching and realized I could make a difference on kids. I could make a difference on families and young people, uh, and really at the small school level, probably even more so because you know, a lot of those kids, that's why they were going to college. That's how they were going to college, right. and maybe only had one, one or two offers where. You know, at Penn State, these guys all have multiple opportunities and multiple offers. So uh, that's that's why I got into it. And even to this day, you know, I think it's critical. I talk to my team about this all the time. I think it's very important that we all know what our why is. So for me, doing interviews like this and reminding myself of why I got into this profession in the first place, I think is really important. And the wins are important, uh, but the wins really are important because they they allow you to continue doing what you want to do, which is make a difference in people's lives. And and the winning allows you to stay in a place uh, to be able to do that long term. What fuels you more, right? The desire to win or the fear of a failure? You know what? Growing up, I was a big fear of failure guy. You know, when I when I was young, I had a lot of anxiety about about not being successful and and the fear of failure. I was I was driven by that. I, I, I'll admit it. Um, but I think the older I I've gotten, it's been more about you know um, winning and finding a way to be successful. And I guess what I would say to you is, it, it's not necessarily winning for me. It's the pursuit of winning. It's the championship habits that, you, that you're living and teaching every single day. It's about how you go about your business. You know, you're not going to win every single battle, although I wish we could. I wish I could. Um, but it's about being able to put your head on the pillow at the end of the day and feeling really good about what you accomplished, about how you went about your business, about how you treated people, and that you made the tough choice, you know, um, not taking the path of least resistance and, and doing what's, you know, what's going to be best for Penn State, doing what's going to be best for our football players and team and coaches and for my family. Sure. So, you know, that that's what drives me now is, is this pursuit of being the best version of myself and, and the same thing for my staff and team. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. You know, when you arrived at Penn State in a way, you know, you recruited the community as much as you did players. What do you know about the community now that you wish you knew when you got there? I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going to kind of go off on a little bit of a tangent here first. Okay. Okay. You know, that's one of the big things that, that I believe is, you know, uh, you go out and hire a coach and that's great, but you, you better be able to figure out that institutional knowledge and that community knowledge as quick as you possibly can. So what I would do is I would always identify about 40 people um, on campus in the community that I don't work with directly that I've heard from multiple sources that these are influential people, these are knowledgeable people, and I would take them out to either breakfast, lunch, or dinner, 
it's amazing what you can get done with a hat and a t-shirt. You know, uh, <laughs> you, 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 you bring a hat and a t-shirt, you give it to them, <laughs> they're taking the breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Right away, they're sitting there the whole time waiting you, waiting for you to ask them for something. And and for me, I wasn't asking them for anything. It was, here's a hat and a t-shirt. I wanted to introduce myself. I wanted to get to know you. And I would ask them, what do you know after being at Penn State for 15 years or 10 years or whatever it is? that you wish you knew in the first couple of years. And I get a little upset sometimes when people talk about, you know, when we first got to Penn State, I was reading an article the other day that my SID sent me and the article had had our record the first two years that nobody, a lot of times when they write that in there, they don't write really the circumstances that we walked into and the, and the mm-hmm. challenges. Mm-hmm. Because I don't know how you tell one story without the other. Sure. So for me, being able to kind of figure those things out as quickly as I possibly could was important and probably more challenging. You know, this is a place that's pretty um, change averse, I would say. Mm-hmm. You know, we had the same head coach for 50 years. Um, I don't look like that head coach. I don't act like that head coach. And I think it's very important that we all stay true and authentic to ourselves. Sure. But I didn't look like what they expected the head football coach at Penn State to look like. And I didn't maybe kind of carry myself that way. So it was a big change. And and for me, you know, I have just learned about what's really important to Penn State. Um, and I think I think really the Penn State community has really found out about me that I may not do it exactly the way it was done in the past. But I think what, what we've all come to realize is the core values, the core principles, the things that are truly the most important, not the packaging, what's truly the most important thing, that, that this is not a winning at all cost university, this is not a community, this is a place that truly wants to do it the right way. And that's how I'm wired, too. And I, I hate to say this, but that's not really the case everywhere. Sure, you know, no um, question. Yeah, sadly. yeah, winning, winning drives everything. And this isn't that type of place. So this is a place that that cares deeply um, about the whole process. That cares deeply about the student athlete. Um, that cares deeply about how people perceive and view in our university and our, our community. So I think the values are there. And I, I kind of always knew it, but I knew it from afar and, and being ingrained in the community now and being ingrained on campus, it means even more to me now. And, and you know, and you hear it from so many different places, the lettermen, you know, the community, you know, the administration, everything. And what's great and the reason it's worked is there's alignment, you know, yeah, because if true. there's not alignment, it's not going to work. If the head coach has got one philosophy and the community and the lettermen and the, and the, and the history of the program, those things aren't aligned. It's not going to work. It doesn't matter how good of a coach you are. Mm-hmm. You know, it's amazing to me because when you took over the Penn state job, you know, they'd been through five coaches in 27 months, right? The NCAA investigations were still happening. How did you walk into that environment? And, and you just talked about it a little bit, but how'd you walk into that environment and build trust and relationships with 18 and 20 year old guys? Well, I think it helped that I had such an easy job before that at Vanderbilt. That, that, you know, I think that helped me. So it's such an easy job. Uh, just kidding. But I think coming to, to Penn State, I think your, your point is a good one. Um, I actually think it was probably more challenging. And what I mean by that is at Vanderbilt, there really had been no success there. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, one winning season in 30 years. So what I, what I found is when we went in there and we showed the players, you know, and the administration and the community that we cared and that we had a plan and that we were going to fight for them, those kids jumped in with both feet right away. There was immediate buy-in because they had gone two and 10 the two previous years before we showed there. So you know, these are kids that have been successful their entire life and now had not been successful, wanted to get back to that. Where when you take over a program like Penn State, that although it was really a challenging time, the program had never really hit rock bottom. And a lot of times hitting rock bottom for programs is a good thing because it forces you outside of your comfort zone and it forces you to say, okay, this isn't working. What do we need to do to get things back? So since that had never happened, here I am coming in 
again, like you mentioned, fifth head coach in 27 months, right. trying to get the guys to buy in to a different way of doing things. And we all know young people, a lot of times feel like there's one way to be right. This is the way you do it. You know, so now here you come in with a pretty radically um, different approach to doing this. And there was an immediate buy-in. And that was hard for me because, again, I just got done at Vanderbilt and had a bunch of success in a pretty tough conference. And the kids jumped in right away. And why was it not happening? So I think your point of the fifth head coach in 27 months, the players had really built a wall up. You know, um, it was about them protecting each other. And, you know, why would they buy into another coach that wasn't going to be there very long? Um, because that's what they had experienced. So chipping away at that and building that trust, because as we all know, on any team, in any organization, in any business, that's the critical component. You better have trust. Yeah. You, know, you better have trust. They better believe in you. You better believe in them. And once you have that, then everything else can go. So that was a lot of hard work. Um, and at the end of the day, although we want the process to go quickly, the most important you know, aspect of that is time. What are some unconventional ways you approach relationships and, and team building, right? Like maybe it's an example or a tip that other leaders that are listening can implement. Um, you know, that would be awesome to hear. Yeah, you know, it's a fine line because some of the stuff that we do, I love, and I necessarily don't want everybody knowing what we do. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, I think it's, it's little things. Nick Saban isn't listening to this show, man. Dabo's yeah, not yeah. listening. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's interesting, you know, um, and what I've tried to do each off season, you know, since we were really able to transition the year before we won the big 10 championship, I had identified, you know, somewhere around 35 guys on the team that I felt like I needed to go out to dinner with either. They were guys that were critical, uh, what I call culture drivers, guys that I knew would be in the locker room, reinforcing our message that I need to get on the same page with, or they were guys that were on the bubble. And, mm -hmm. you know, I needed to sit down with them. So it's amazing, again, back to that breakfast, lunch, or dinner, when you can go out with somebody one-on-one -on -one and spend some time with them and talk to them, especially guys that you didn't recruit. You right, know? So sure. Guys that you can sit down and talk to and listen to and ask questions. But I always say, don't ask questions that you don't want to hear the answers to. <laughs> like, you, 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 yeah. you want to hear. Yeah, you know? for sure. So, I think that was really valuable, probably more than anything, the players seeing that I did care and I was going to take time to listen to their perspectives, what they liked, what they didn't like, why. I think that was really valuable. One of the other things that we've always done, you know, since Vanderbilt is um, our locker room is not set up like most teams. A lot of teams the D line all sits in one spot. The quarterbacks all sit in one area. The wide receivers where our entire locker room every year we change it. And you're sitting next to different people every year in a locker room and they're not positioned, um, you know, the, the mm -hmm. similarities. So mm -hmm. it'll be a quarterback next to a D lineman, next to a kicker, next to a, next to an O lineman, next to a snapper. And then on top of that, as much as we can, the locker room is all broken up racially as well. Awesome. Black, white, black, white, black, white, as yeah. much as we possibly can. So there's, cause everybody says, Oh, we're a family. Everybody says mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times you ask that D lineman to tell you something about the long snapper. They can't, they don't know those guys, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? So just being very intentional about how we go about things and how we build that, you know, those relationships and how we build that trust um, I think is I think is uh, been a big part of our success. You know, you turned around Vanderbilt. You've turned around Penn State. There's a lot of leaders listening that may be in similar situations, right, where they're trying to turn a culture around from where it is now to where they want it to go. In addition to spending time, right, in addition to some of the things you said, what are some other things that you have seen work that clearly you've done and done well? Well, I think that consistency is critical because – when you're trying to, to get a team to buy in, when you're trying to you know, build that culture, there's going to be resistance to that in the, for, in the beginning. Guys are going to push back and they're going to look for areas with cracks or weaknesses. So it's very important for us that everybody's singing a song and everybody's singing this, the same song in the same tune. 
So what I mean by that is the athletic training department, they're on the same page with the coaches, that the academic staff is on the same page with the coaches. Each area is on the same page because if there's an area that's not aligned and you know those players that you're trying to get on board, they're going to find it and they're going to go to that area and it's going to create challenges and issues. So I think the consistency in your messages, the head coach down to the assistant coaches to the academic staff and everybody else. So we meet you know, every single morning during the season at 7 a.m. and at all season at 8 a.m. And everybody that's pretty much involved in our football program is in there. And I know people have different philosophies on meeting. Some people do it a little bit and some people do it a lot. I'm more on the a lot standpoint. I'd rather meet every single day and make sure everybody's on the same page with what we're trying to do and how we're trying to do it. I think that is critical. Um, The other thing I would say is we always take time in the spring and then also before the season starts to have a staff retreat. Uh, Most coaches want to sit around and talk ball and X's and O's Mm -hmm. and schemes, which is critical, but also taking some time every single year to talk about, okay, what is our philosophy? What are our core values? Um, How do we go about our business and why? And just sit down and spend some time going through these things because what will happen is you may have a really strong culture in year one. And then as you have staff turnover and things like that, five years down the road, you think everybody understands the philosophy, but they don't anymore. So you have to take the time to go through that. And then I think when once you have that, and the players all see that the coaches and the staff are all on the same page, it's hard not to get bought into the, the philosophy and the culture because they're just being hammered by it from every single direction. You know, you're, you're a big planner, structure, right? Attention to detail guy. How do you balance that with the need to be, you know, adaptive and flexible and, and, and certainly obviously lean into change at times? Well, I think this is probably perfect timing for this question because <laughs> this, uh, this virus um, obviously has challenged all of us in every aspect of life. And, and for me as a football coach who I like to have the entire year day by day mapped out in what we're going to do and how we're going to do it and how we're going to go about our business, typically before, before the season starts in training camp, We have all the bowls. Any bowl that we could possibly go to is scheduled out and organized in the summer so we know. And here we are now at a time where it's hard to plan anything because we don't know when this is going to end. So it's hard to come up with a plan or a calendar of how you're going to approach your business when we're not in control of the viruses. Right. Um, that's, That's challenging. So I think in a lot of ways, for me and for my staff, this has been good. You know, this has been good because the reality is the best organizations, the best teams, the, the most successful individuals are going to be able to take times like this uh, and grow from them. It, it, you talk about forcing you outside your comfort zone. <laughs> um, you know, so for us, embracing technology you know, we've really done a good job of embracing technology and finding different ways to interact with our players, different ways to interact as the staff and different ways to communicate and educate. Um, so, you know, I think this is, this is a really good example. This is completely different work environment that I've ever been in. And although probably for the first couple of days I was uncomfortable and for the first couple of days I was kind of resistant to some things, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a good place right now. And I think as an organization, we're in a good place. And, and the reality is the most successful teams, organizations, and individuals will come out of this better than they were before, because they're going to learn something about themselves. They're going to learn something about their organizations and they're going to grow. And that's how you better be approaching everything in life. Yeah. Amen. I know I've talked to a ton of coaches lately and I think, you know, great coaches have that mindset, right? How can you look back at the window of time and say, I, we, we leaned into this and we came out better in a myriad of categories and, and more connected than ever. What's your approach after a loss, right? And how does it differ from your approach after a win? Another good question. <laughs> you know, I, I think I, I recognized the last couple of years that I was not as the leader 
handling losses well. Um, and I hate to say it, but I had become one of those guys where the wins are just expected and the losses tear your heart out. And you ask the players and you ask the staff to move on, win or lose. And if you're not doing that as the leader, it's hard for everybody else in the organization to do it. So I spent a lot of time, you know, talking to different people, different coaches, different leaders, executives uh, about that, about how I could be better. And, um, you know, we really kind of instituted some things in the last couple of years. And it's been, I think it's been really impactful. I, I think the reality is if you get caught up too much in the wins or the losses, no different than the praise or the criticism, uh, it's going to have a negative effect. You know, the reality is, as we all know, you can learn a lot through losses. Sure. But what you also are hopeful of is through your experience, your staff's experience, that you can teach those things without having to experience them. Hey, these are the things that lead to winning. These are the things that lead to, to losing. And although we won the game, these three or four things, if, if we don't get those things fixed, they're going to come back to haunt us at some point. So for me, it's just getting everybody to understand we want to prepare like crazy. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit of a psychopath <laughs> Sunday, you know, through Thursday. That's when I'm nervous. That's when, because it's like, I got to make sure that we got everything covered and we're thorough and we're detailed. But by the time the game comes, if I'm nervous, then that means we didn't do a great job in preparation. And, and then what you hope, which is easier said than done, but what you hope is Saturday night after the game that no matter what the result is, you can still sleep well because you know you did everything you possibly could to be successful. You can live with that. You know, it's it's the times where you're looking back and saying woulda, shoulda, coulda. You know, so we we just try to do everything we possibly can to focus on the process of success and the habits that we try to ingrain in ourselves and our players, the championship habits that are gonna allow us to be successful not just in football but in life. In all your years of coaching, what would you say your greatest leadership lesson has been? I guess what I would say is the experience at Vanderbilt was, I think, really important. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, as a first-time head coach, I was able to go to a place, and, and, and again, I don't want this to come off disrespectful to anybody. I don't, I don't mean it that way. I'm just, I'm just kind of speaking on my experience and from the heart. But I went to a place, and I had a vision, and I had a plan. And some places you go to, they're so big and there's so many people involved that you can't truly do it your own way. There's a lot of influences. So for me, I was able to go to Vanderbilt and had a, had a theory and had a plan and was able to work the plan and we were able to be successful. But there was a lot of growing pains. There was a lot of things that we learned during that time and grew, but we were, I guess what I'm saying is we were at a place that allowed us to do that. Um, it wasn't in front of 80,000 or a hundred thousand. Right. Sure. You know, so I, I think obviously, you know, for me, I spent 10 years planning and preparing to be a head coach, but also go into a place that's going to allow you to grow. David Williams was the AD there was a huge mentor, father figure for me, passed away last year. You know, David was a big part of it as well. He was someone that we kind of grew together with when it came to football. So I, I think, you know, probably the biggest lesson for me is you, you better have a plan and you better be organized and you better be passionate about that plan. But then also you better be strategic about where you go and when you go, because you see people that are promoted too fast and then they never get another opportunity because they weren't prepared for the opportunity when it came or people that aren't willing to ever take the risk and, and make a jump. You know, I had a lot of people telling me to not take the Vanderbilt job. Um, and, you know, obviously, you know, it, it worked out well for us. So I just think the combination of having a plan, being organized, being passionate about your plan, being willing to adjust 
you know, aspects of the plan, but your core values and your core ingredients that are so important as a leader, as a team, as an organization, those can never change Yeah, where everything else can adjust and adapt. So coach, we end with rapid fire. I'm going to hit you with some questions. You just fire back. All right. All right. One word to describe yourself. Passionate. One word your guys would use to describe you. Um, psychotic. <laughs> in a good in a good way. I don't know if that's possible, but in a good way. It's psychotic. Well, uh, tell me what what do you what do you mean? Give me a little color on that. Yeah, I'm saying in a funny way when yeah, I say yeah. psychotic, but I guess my greatest strength I would say is my passion and my drive. Yeah. My yeah. greatest weakness is my passion and my yeah, drive. Yeah, for sure. And I am just driven and determined about everything. And that's about our team's success. But more importantly, it's about the player's individual success. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So favorite ice cream flavor at the creamery. This is from one of my teammates who's a Penn Stater. All right. Now, now you're going to get upset with me like my <laughs> wife does. But I'm not a favorites guy. I don't have a favorite food. Oh, God. I didn't okay. have a favorite like color before coming to Penn State. Now I got to say I have a favorite <laughs> color. But... I love ice cream in general, which is not a good thing. Because you know how you have the freshman 15? Yeah. Well, now you have the 40-year-old 40, which is what, <laughs> what I got. So the ice cream is not a good thing because if you've never had it before, it is it is fantastic. Is but it? Um, I don't have a specific favorite. Got it. Okay. But you hit that place periodically, right? Yeah. Yes, I All do. Right, Probably too often. All right. So the person who would play you in a movie or a TV show? I'd like to say Denzel Washington, like everybody else in the country. Yeah. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, what about the guy that played you in front of your team? Oh, yeah. Keegan. Keegan's <laughs> my guy. It's actually his birthday the other day. I sent him a video because he was supposed to have a birthday party. His wife hit me up. Okay. Um, but obviously, with, with what's going on, we're able sure. to do it. So I sent him a video. But yeah, Keegan is just phenomenal. Sure. Um, that you know, was pretty you know, cool. Just, yeah, he's been great. One thing on your bucket list? I guess professionally is obviously, you know, the national championship for, for this community and for these players and, and for the team. That That's something that drives me. There's no doubt about it. And then, and then personally, you know, um, it's my family. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you know, how can I spend more quality time with my family, travel, whatever it may be. You know, the interesting thing is, you know, you talk about, you know, blessings in disguise. Mm-hmm. The time that I've had with my daughters right now has been phenomenal. Um, you know, I'm still working, but they can come in and give me a hug or I can step out and have lunch with them mm-hmm. or breakfast or whatever. So this time I think has been just tremendous uh, for our family. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, a little bit of both. Sure. One word to describe Penn State football. I would say uh, pride. This is such a prideful community. So the show's called Game Changers. So one last question. What game changer or who is a game changer who inspires you and why? A game changer, you know, for me, um, one specific you know, thing or person is, is mm-hmm. hard to say. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I probably would, would say my wife. Mm-hmm. And I guess what I mean by that is I have a lot of what I think a lot of coaches have, which is is coach guilt that we don't spend enough time with our families and, and our wives and our kids. And you better have a, a strong woman at home or a strong mm-hmm. husband at home mm-hmm. um, that can balance all that. And she better be strong and she better be intelligent. She better be independent. So for me, my wife allowing me to do what I'm passionate about and be an unbelievable mother. Um, she's been a game changer for me. You know, she's been a game changer for me, no doubt about it. And then, and then I could name just so many players that have inspired me um, in terms of the type of teammates they were, and how they were with my daughters. Mm-hmm. There's just so many of them. You, you hate to sing, signal one guy out, but there's just been so many that, that I'm so proud of and they've inspired me. Yeah. Well, hey, Coach, thank you so much for taking a minute and uh, just wishing you nothing but the best. Nothing but the best in the future. You too. This was a great interview. I appreciate the time. I thought the questions were awesome, and I look forward to spending more time with you in the future. Awesome, Coach. Well, thanks so much, and and I do as well. I'd be honored and humbled, so thank you. Thank you. You be safe. You too. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. 
If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.